Motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to episode 91 of the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host, and the title for this week's episode is Role, and my special guest is Julie Peasgood. Julie's career spans over 40 years of prestigious theatre and television, but she's probably best known for her roles in Brookside, Emmerdale and Hollyoaks. She has a prestigious career portfolio, including TV presenting, writing and as an events host. A veteran of over 80 cruises, Julie's contributing editor for Cruise International magazine and writes about travel and lifestyle for the Mail on Sunday. She has regular monthly columns in Group Leisure and Travel and Crafts Beautiful magazines, the latter featuring her newest business venture, Supercrafts at Sea. Julie's also one of the country's leading voiceover artists and has received the Royal Television Society's prestigious Television Personality of the Year Award. I can't wait to explore all the roles she's played over the years, on and off camera. But before we get going, I want to spotlight one of our listeners. Nina emailed in with her thoughts on last week's episode with Janine Esbrand. And I want to give her a big shout out. Thank you for getting in touch. Now, here's what she said. I really enjoyed your interview with Janine. Having trained as a lawyer myself, it was great to hear that I'm not alone in seeking more than my career beyond billable hours. Thanks for sharing her story on the podcast. Well, Nina, I'm so grateful to you for tuning in. I'm happy to hear when an episode like this hits home. Thank you hugely for not only listening, but taking action and letting us know. I love to hear about that. If you'd like to leave a review and possibly be a spotlight on the podcast, you can do so on Apple Podcasts or be in touch at hello at schoolformothers.com. I won't keep you waiting any longer. Let's dive on into my episode with Julie Peasgood on Roll. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast, Julie. I am so excited to talk to you today. The feeling's mutual. (laughs) Oh, thank you. And there's so much we can talk about around the episode title of Roll. There really is, isn't it? Because, I mean, you have something of a pedigree, don't you? I mean, well, you're rather famous, aren't you? (laughs) Yes, I've had my moment in the limelight and hopefully more to come. Um, uh, Mm. I've had a break from acting for a while, but um, we'll talk about that, uh, obviously, as the podcast goes on. But yes, I'm I'm quite, um, I suppose I do wear a lot of hats and enjoy doing so as well. Yes, a lot of different roles, which I know we're going to chat about. Yeah, I mean, where did it begin? which, Which role was your first role, do you think? Okay, um, I think, well, definitely the first role was as a ballet dancer. I, my mum was a tightrope walker and a juggler in Bertram Mill Circus. Oh, um, goodness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she was, it was wonderful. And so we grew up um, with her teaching us sort of as many tricks as we could muster on the back lawn. But it became apparent that I, uh, rather quickly, that I didn't have any sort of high wire skills. Um, <laughs> not the same as she did. And, and I really loved ballet. I, I had a wonderful teacher in Grimsby, um, Penny Smith, who's still going strong. And I, I won an audition. I got an audition and won a scholarship to a school um, down in London called Arts Educational. I mm-hmm. uh, went down there, loved it, found, though, rather sadly, I was growing a bit too tall. And also I'd been, you know, I suppose, if I'm honest, a big fish in a little littler pond in Grimsby, but down in London. I wasn't, you know, a good enough dancer, really. I might have made it into the corps de ballet. Um, but very fortunately, Danusha, I injured my foot. I had an accident, uh, which uh, made me uh, stop dancing for a few months. And I went over onto the acting side of things. My course was 50-50, which was both acting and dancing anyway. So instead of focusing on ballet, I focused on acting and I loved it. I felt like 
I'd come home, if you like. So, mm-hmm. so, so the ballet dancing, which I still love. I still go to ballet in my, I'm 64, and I still do the odd class in London. But I switched um, from that to acting, and it was a, a, a good choice, a good choice, a happy choice. Yeah, a fortuitous uh, yes. kind of switch. I mean, I, I get what you mean about the 50-50 piece, but it sounds like originally your love was the ballet and then, and then yeah. funnily enough, you found the magic of, of the acting. Where yeah. do you, just while we're on, on the ballet in London, where do you go? Where do you go as a, a 64-year-old to, to do? I mean, presumably oh, you're yeah. rather good still, I imagine. So I'm not, I'm not so good at, at jumping because I, I I have an uh, injury to my heel, but I love everything else. And um, yeah, you do retain it. I go round the corner. There's a lovely little ballet school um, round the corner, and there's also one uh, a class in my local swimming swimming pool. And yeah, I mean, I I just really enjoy it. You know, sort of you can do exercises at the bar and then in the centre. Wow. Um, you know, all, all of but but I mean, I I do still. When I hear any lovely music or watch Strictly, I, I can't resist, as I'm sure loads of us do, you know, joining in with the odd pirouette and stuff like that. You don't, <laughs> you don't you forget. Don't, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you absolutely you yeah. don't forget. So, so you, you found your love in acting and that was your, you know, you come home. Yeah, and I had the most wonderful break, really lucky break at the big, very beginning of my career because I went up for an interview for something, a series called Seven Faces of Woman. And oh. I went up for the very first uh, sort of one in the, in the series. Uh, to, it was um, a part called Cherry Ripe in a play called Cherry Ripe and the Lugworm Digger, in which the character of Cherry Ripe lost her innocence, if you like, um, lost her virginity to this lugworm digger and I I got the role <laughs> against all the odds I had waist length hair which they put a pudding basin on and cut round it so I looked awful little national health type um, specs those ones that were always broken with a bit of sellotape across them <laughs> um, and yes I was 17 I had my name above the title Julie P's Good Inn which I don't think has ever happened um, you know since um, but best of all Charles Aznavour was asked to write the theme music for the series and he wrote She and, and that was played out. I was, I was the first person to have She. I don't think he wrote it for me, he wrote it for the series, but I always like to, I, I, you know, whenever I hear Charles Aznavour, uh, the late, wonderful Charles Aznavour singing She, um, it brings back, a, a re, you know, very happy memories. It's a really beautiful piece of music. Yeah, isn't it? Really it's good. absolutely gorgeous, and yeah. and of course lasted. I mean, it's it, it's a stunner. So so for, from having that lucky break, how I mean, how did your how did your career in so many roles explode? I mean, you know, how did um, that all happen? Okay, well, it it I went on, you know, sort of to do lots, lots and lots of acting, lots of telly, a lovely mm. long series in the north called This Year and Next Year, five years with the RSC, um, other theatre work at um, at the Old Vic, a lot of really, you know, good classy credits and um, Taggart and masses of dramas, you know, Boone and all of the ones uh, going at the time. I think I've done Casualty. I think I've done Casualty twice. Doctors three times and Holby City a couple of times. Um, but oh, and, and of course, the soaps. Um, my gosh, I did. I had Barry Grant's baby in Brookside. Um, I then crossed the Pennines to Hollyoaks. And I also, uh, no, crossed the Pennines, sorry, to Emmerdale. And then crossed back again to do Hollyoaks. So, yeah, I've done three soaps. I was a leather-clad motorbike riding VAT inspector in Emmerdale and you don't get many of them to the pound I can tell you <laughs> no. um, really good fun and Hollyoaks I was probably one of the oldest cast members but it didn't matter um, and my daughter Kate McHenry as she was uh, known then she was single then joined the cast we weren't mum and dad and uh, mum and daughter but we did go on um uh, I'm a celebrity, sorry, who wants to be a millionaire rather, on Christmas Day 2000, early 2000s, um, which was lovely. And we won, I think we won 16 grand for St Andrew's Hospice. Nice. So lots and lots of things happening in the acting world. And then I went on 
to This Morning with Anne Diamond. And I, we, we were chatting away on the show and she had this little doll. I remember this, this well, it wasn't even a doll. It was a weird little thing. And it, it um, sprayed this jet of wee-wee uh, out of it. It, it, was, it was horrible. And she said, she said, do you like the, you know, this is my new sort of favorite toy or whatever. I can't remember. What? And, I, and then I said, no, not toy in that sense. I, I said, I said, well, she said, I think this is really sweet. I think that was it. And I said, I think it was disgusting. And straight after the interview, I was asked to go to the um, editor's office, uh, Mike Hollingsworth, who was actually married to Undiamond. And I thought, well, what have I, what, you know, I thought I'm in trouble. I've done something wrong. I obviously, I, you know, I went off and to his office and I walked in and he said, you want to present? And I said, wow, I'd, I'd love to, because presenting was something that I'd, I wanted to get into for years, but back then you didn't diversify. Back in the 90s, people were either an actress or a presenter. The two didn't cross like they do now. You know, people do have many roles now. Yeah. Um, and then I and then I became a presenter on this morning. I was the TV reviewer for a couple of years, and I loved it. And paradoxically, it's very different being yourself, obviously, to to acting a role. And I actually found it very liberating. I loved it. So I thought, right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do more of this. And 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 I have done. I stood in for um, Judy with Richard and Judy when Judy wasn't well for a period, and I've done. Um, boot sale challenge, lots and lots of things, loose women back in the day, um, lots of food programs, which I love, and lots of travel programs. So that was, a, that was the second hat to be worn, if you like. So we've got actress and presenter. And then, and then I was invited to, I was presenting a gardening program. That's right. And it turned out that my co-presenter actually was also a book publisher. And he'd got a series of books called the, um, the Greatest Guides, as it were. So it was The Greatest Guide to Podcasting, uh, The Greatest Guide to DIY, The Greatest Guide. And I said, gosh, who's written The Greatest Guide to Sex? That must be a bestseller. And he said, nobody. Uh, are you interested? And I thought, well, <laughs> that's a bit out of left field. And, and, and I said, oh, wow. I said, well, he said, listen, send me, send me, because I'd been doing a bit of writing. He said, send me some examples of your writing. And funnily enough, have you ever heard of a wonderful woman called Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth Vestheimer? Mm. She's, she's probably in her late 80s, even 90s now. She's American. She's this little tiny, uh, wonderful um, uh, Dr. Ruth, this, this, this little, little Jewish magnet, amazing dynamo of a woman who speaks about sex so frankly and in such an easy way. And back when I was about 14, I thought when I grow up, properly. I want to be her. So it was so weird that he said, you know, I was f f late 40s, 50 at the time. And he said, you know, do you, do you, would you like to write this book? And I thought, isn't it funny? You make a wish, you make a goal when you're very young and it takes 30 odd years to come about, but hey. Um, so mm. I sent him some examples and I got out this vast array of research books that I'd accumulated over the years because I was always interested in the subject <laughs> um, on a you know, practical level as well as physical. And, um, and I got the commission <laughs> and I wrote the book, a factual book, and it, and it won an award. It won the best sex writer of, of that year, which was... <laughs> you do crack <laughs> me up. <laughs> well, you sit there, Danusha, you sit there writing. <laughs> Often, I'm, I'm quite a morning person, but weirdly enough, when I was writing the book, I found that if I stayed up late and wrote in the very early hours, like one, two, three o'clock even, that, that's when I found most inspiration. But you do sit there and you think, golly, is anybody going to find this helpful or hopefully funny when it was meant to be funny? And is it going <laughs> to... Is it going to help people? That's what I wrote it for. But but you know, I was I was thrilled when I um uh, when I won this award from Scarlet Magazine, and uh, and that led me to going on to the Alan Titchmarsh show, and from that. I was asked to be his kind of relationship sex expert. And, and that 
I was there for four years, um, which was amazing. And, and the book, I suppose the book, first of all, was published a, as a paperback. And then rather appropriately, it, it went hard, which was, um, which was you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, you couldn't make this up, could you? Next <laughs> <laughs> version is going to be a pop up. No, that's a joke. That's a joke. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, no more. <laughs> <laughs> with my husband. But no, it, it, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was, Alan Titchmarsh was wonderful to work with. He's, um, do you know, he's the most, he's the most fondled character in Madame Tussauds. Truly, I see. He, he beats David Beckham <laughs> and somebody else, hands down. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's that the twinkle he has, but, um, but we got on. Is it really his twinkle? I think it must be. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's yeah. I know he, I think it's his sense of humour, and he's a yeah. lovely guy. I mean, it, believe you me, talking about sex um, on a weekday afternoon and trying to sort of be as tasteful as possible, but still get important information across it's not an easy call but I think by and large we managed it and from that came the writing so there was several years wearing the, the relationships had and at the same time I actually had five columns I think I had now magazine yours magazine the um which paper was it anyway i had <laughs> i can't remember yeah. I, had, I had you know it was it, it was um uh, it was quite a productive time and then i also from uh, one of the companies uh, love honey which are one of the are probably the biggest company selling sex toys i was asked to invent my own range of interesting products for consenting adults which I did. Um, and sex it, toys, it, well, yes? Yeah, yeah, sex mm-hmm. toys. And they were really, Danusha, they were very classy. They were called Swoon. My husband thought of the title. The packaging was Tiffany Duck Egg Blue. Um, they were seriously classy. When, the, when you're in boots, you could put them in your shopping basket, your trolley, and nobody would know what they are. They look like a really elegant bath product or something <laughs> like that. And I was proud of that. You know, I didn't want to do Penelope's purple thruster or anything like that. I wanted no. actually something really nice. Poor yeah. Penelope. <laughs> it's not on, is it? It's not on. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Anyway, that was um, that was quite an interesting um, time. And then I thought I got to fifty five, and I thought, you know what? I've loved attempting to be Dr. Ruth. Nobody can be Dr. Ruth. She's a one-off. And I thought, mm. you know, I started to feel that actually I'd, I'd had enough of that. It was great. It was great. But, you, you, you know, you do get asked um, a lot of the same questions. And, um, and, and I just thought I, I've learned a lot from this. But what I've learned most of all is that I actually love writing. So if I'm not don't want to write about sex anymore what do I want to write about and that was my other another passion is travel I love 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 travel can I just Uh, stop you a minute Julie yeah presumably during that time when you were doing the relationship all the work and and the the books and the and the sex toys presumably you were actually going through the menopause too at the time Yes, I was indeed. So that's quite an interesting period, isn't it, for women? Yeah. I mean, I say, you know, it's a pivotal time for women. Very and much. yeah, so to be to be <laughs> you know, grappling with on a daily basis <laughs> the the yeah. machinations of sex and and what it means in relationships and I presume libido and all of the kind of questions that we would get. I would imagine that was quite something for you. Yeah, it was. Well, it's it, that's a very insightful remark actually, Denisha, because it was when I was 55 and people would write in the, the, the most sort of common, if you like, popular question was how can, you know, we improve, how can I improve my sex life? Or, you know, I've got a stronger libido than my partner. What can we do? And it was when I actually wanted to write back, do you know, sometimes a cuddle can be really lovely. And don't forget about kissing, which kissing mm. is so important. But it was when I actually started, I suppose my own libido was lessening, which it does for us all. And, you know, you're very lucky if it doesn't, I think. But as a, it does tail off. 
And, and I, that, that's when I think, I thought, you know what? I don't feel as authentic writing about this anymore. Um, mm. You know, and, and, you know, I am hugely lucky. I have, the, I have a wonderful husband. He is my best friend and mm. we still enjoy a very active in all senses life together, I'm thrilled to say. But that's a different thing, as you say, from being faced with sex and all its machinations on a daily basis. Mm. Um, plus my postman wouldn't actually speak to me anymore because so many toys had arrived that he'd had to take delivery of (laughs) that he just thought this woman is obscene no 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 (laughs) she's running something that yeah (laughs) some cd yeah and that's that's another thing actually when you're reviewing because with designing my own range when you're actually reviewing a lot of toys and you do have a duty to do that a to to write about them anyway but b to know what you want to design and what you don't want to design, it loses. It's a bit like making love when you're actually trying for a baby, when that's mm. your sole purpose. It takes the edge off the passion and the, you know, when you're actually using toys like that it, and, and sort of saying, you know, what do you think? Is it strong enough or whatever? It, it just takes a bit of the magic out of it, really. Yeah, of course it does. I mean, mm. we're, not, we're not going to linger too, too much on this, but... <laughs> Loyal, loyal listeners know that, uh, or, or or even our listeners know already that when I was a senior academic, Julie, I, you know, I'm a, a leadership theoretician, so that's that's what I was in a business school. But I, for one reason or another, um, became the world's leading expert on sex shops, and I did. I researched sex shops for nearly four years. Oh I was, wow! Yeah, and I was the only um, academic in this country that, well, one that had permission to watch porn as part of her job, <laughs> which made me very popular, I can tell you, uh, and which was, was not anywhere near as glamorous and fun as it sounds. And, and also, I, you know, I, was, I, I got lots of funding to go and, to go and uh, research sex shops and work in them. And so I actually, from experience, know what it's like and, and could talk endlessly about all sorts of very odd and fun, great, wonderful, poignant uh, events that happened in sex shops around the world. And so I do, I do know. And I became very desensitized to it to the point where I think it was one day I was, I, I, I was at a dinner party and somebody mentioned something and I mentioned butt plugs. And my husband <laughs> at the time looked at me like you've really lost it now <laughs> you've really lost it Danusha like do you not realize that <laughs> this is not the subject and of course you know we're talking a while ago but and, and even now it would be a bit funny so so I really do understand you know it's a world in itself I learned by the way how to make a dildos but do you see, we really could talk about this. We really could. <laughs> and, and I've just remembered, thank heavens, because I hate forgetting things. Um, uh, the the, the column I had was in the Sunday Mirror. Um, oh, fantastic. So was in their celebs magazine. Yeah, I wrote about that. But no, Amazing. It's fascinating the way that you've chosen that word desensitized. You do. I would go around. Um, I went, I remember a particular trip to Love Honey, um, where they said, come and actually sort of, um, you know, because they were the ones who made the range for me. And uh, they said, come and have a look. And, and you do, you wander among these shelves of all these, you know, sort of dildos and vibrators and, and all of these things. And you're just studying them and looking at them. And there's no embarrassment. You're talking about them like you might be talking about bags of rice on the, on the supermarket. Yes. Shelf or mm-hmm. It's very, very strange. It is. <laughs> so, when, so when you realised that actually writing was what you really wanted to do yes. and... Oh, what happened? You know, where, I mean, I, I know you just said travel. So how did you transition from those, <laughs> those things on those shelves over into Again, travel? Again, very fortunately, you know, I, as I say, I've, I love new opportunities. And I was trying to think last night, you know, did, did I, I didn't necessarily decide, you know, sort of way back mm. when I want to be this, do that, do that then. Um, it's just, it, it, it's happened, but I guess it's happened because I, I suppose I'm, I'm, I like seizing opportunities. So I was presenting because the acting, although I've done a little less recently because I haven't been had the time, but the acting, the presenting will continue, I hope, always. I never, ever want to move on from that. I've moved on from writing about sex, but acting and presenting always. And I was presenting 
a series for the Travel Channel and I about cruising called Cruise Today. And one of the uh, ships I was on, there was a lovely PR lady and she said, listen, would you write about the ship? Would you write um, uh, about it for the Telegraph? And I said, uh, yeah, I'd love to actually, because I've had a great experience. And I wrote a, a piece for the Telegraph and they liked it and they commissioned a few more. And then out of the blue, the editor of Cruise International magazine, Liz Jarvis, um, uh, who's still the editor, it's about seven years ago now, wrote to me and and emailed me and just said, um, listen, I'd, I'd wonder if you'd be interested in writing for the magazine. I've, you know, I like your work. Would you, would you like to be a contributing editor and, you know, do cruise reviews and, and answer questions in the magazine, etc.? And I jumped at it. I thought, wow. And I love travel, but I really love cruises. I've, until this year, in which all mm. the cruises are, will they ever sail the yes. seas? Then I pray they will. But until the beginning of this year, I'd just uh, I'd done eighty three cruises, so you know I've got a lot under my belt, um, and I've written about cruises for uh, the Telegraph, the Sunday Mirror, uh, Cruise International magazine, of course, Group Traveller magazine. I do group leisure and travel, and I also do general travel for them, and a few other you know sort of periodicals as well. So. It just, as I say, happened. I think if you want something badly enough and you put it out there in, on, in the universe, if that doesn't sound too plonky, and then you take whatever st- action you can towards achieving that goal and just keep focusing on it, that's what I've found has often worked well for me in, in life. Have you found that for you? Yeah, I, I mean, it sounds like you're chiming with the what you focus on expands kind of yes, very much so. you know very philosophy so. isn't it where so if you decide that you'd like to go traveling more hallelujah isn't it or do you suddenly get travel opportunities yes. thrust yes. in front of you yeah and if you want immediately always they don't always have no. but it depends yes but no sorry i interrupted I no, it's fine but you no you don't need to apologize at all you sow the seed don't you it's not like it's it's not as if you're going I must I must this is what's going to happen it's hey wouldn't that be great I love travel it has to be what I actually I can hear in your voice and I'm sure our listeners kind of this authentic passion for the mm-hmm. things that you do you're not a woman who does things half-hearted which is why when the more racy aspects of what you were doing in terms of you know the focus the topic kind of came to its natural pause then actually you were gone weren't you it's yes you can't yes. really inauthentically stay in something no you can't and that was the word i the, you, you, again you're we're very much sort of in rhythm because that was the very word i used i i i, I remember saying i don't feel authentic anymore and when i'm i'm it's not like just being out of your comfort zone it's deeper than that oh and yeah don't mm-hmm. feel real and, and 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 you're imparting things to other people no point continuing you've got to you know you've, you've got to feel as though you you know you are up to the job you've got to feel authentic yeah yeah you do and therefore if travel is is a an abiding passion and a continuing passion yeah. particularly cruises and you found that niche then I mean of course you will wax lyrical and be incredibly effusive about that and that's my god these that's what these brands want isn't it they need yeah. Yeah. they can't have some tepid like a cruise is quite yeah. nice by the way I've never been on a cruise oh Delicia, you've got a treat in store for you when they start again talk to me about which lines, because I've been on, on most of them. Or if you think you might be seasick, then plump for a river cruise. They are wonderful. Well, the thing is, I've, I've always known that, that one, I, that I want to experience cruises. I know that. And two, I know that there's, I'd love to run things on cruises. I'd like to oh, work. Yeah. You know, I know that there's programs that could be done, fun things. So I'm yes. like, I can see the opportunities there as well, commercial opportunities. And I'm like, oh, one day. And of course, you know, at the moment, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, there's a big question mark, isn't there? I mean, there's question marks all over the place for so many yeah. businesses. But, yeah. but basically, you know, that is something that that. Uh, actually, it's quite funny when I'm when I've been pregnant, as you know, I've been pregnant a lot. I get this. <laughs> I get this very odd 
wish to to do something like I'll say oh in fact I've not just say it I'll actually do something about it like I booked for a skydive once and, <laughs> and then and then I realized oh I'm 20 weeks pregnant yes and it's not that I've forgotten I was pregnant in a really weird way I haven't actually forgotten it's just that I it, the, the impossibility of something doesn't occur to me now of course I didn't get to the actual field and I didn't actually the air you know of course I didn't but but nevertheless and I'll start riding or I'll say oh I must go riding and strangely enough early this year the reason I'm saying is early this year I thought do you know what I think it's time for a cruise (laughs) (laughs) that was just before lockdown and I was like oh okay yeah well and uh, you know it's got (laughs) thankfully I'm not pregnant but but nevertheless it's off the it's off the radar right now so I, I love that that the impossibility of something doesn't occur to me I've written that down that that's wonderful. I think I'm the same. I just mm. think, what what can I do to make it happen? To make something. Happen? I had the most wonderful. Can I can I just go um, off on off piste off on a tangent? Of course, yes. Um, I was I did some more acting last year. I did a, a little film for Germany, which was great. And I've done Panto twice in Grimsby, which I loved. Oh. Um, but but I also did a wonderful series by um, called Years and Years by Russell T. Davis, who's um, one of our foremost, um, you know, writers in the country. Doctor Who, a very British scandal, queer as folk, he's a genius. But, but before it, it was, um, we filmed it actually at the end of 2018. And I was writing some new goals. And I, and I, and I got this new, beautiful notebook. And I write loads of goals. I write goals all the time. And, uh, and sometimes I don't review them. If I review them, they work much better. But if I don't review them, sometimes I'll find a notebook six months or a year later and look at it. And a lot of the things that I've written down will have come true. Yes. Simply because of the writing them down. Well, this time I, I wrote down in the book, I want to act again. I wrote, but I want to act in a really prestigious, high class drama, but, but, but playing somebody. So remember those words, prestigious, high class drama. I, and I, I, I wrote down, but playing somebody very close to myself, if possible. Because mm. I was scared. I'd had a gap and, you know, I didn't want to sort of dive back in with a part that was overly challenging because, you know, you, you're a bit tentative at first. It's been a bit of a gap. So that was what I wrote for the first goal. The second goal was, I want to be in I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Yes, I would eat the insects if you, they still allow you to. That was my second goal. And the third goal was, I want to win Pointless. Okay, Pointless is one of my favourite programmes. Oh, yes. So I wrote these down and I put them in front of Micah Honson. I'm, I'm a Buddhist. I've been a Buddhist since 1983. And I chant, every day I chant um, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And Buddhism grounds me, centres me, inspires me, comforts me. So I put them in front of my uh, Gohonzon, which is the scroll I chant, Nami Harenge Kyo 2. And I looked at them. I looked at them every day, but not like in a hammering away kind of way. I just read them every day. About 10 days after I'd written them, my agent rang. Now, my agent doesn't ring very often, sadly. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's not... No, no Julie, stop there. Just leave it there. <laughs> yes. Stop, Julie. He's a, really bloke. He's a, really bloke. <laughs> He's a lovely bloke. <laughs> a lovely bloke. So he called and he said, Julie, he said, um, I said, hello, what can I do for you? And uh, he said, well, he said, I've just had the strangest of telephone calls about you. And I said, oh, wow. He said, do you know a writer? called Russell T. Davis. And I said, yeah, of course I do. He's iconic. And he said, well, he said, apparently he's, he's, he's rather a fan of yours. And I said, wow. And he said, and he's written a new series called Years and Years. And it's an amazing series. It's, 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 it's fantastic. And he said, and, and Dame Emma Thompson is playing the lead. And, and Emma Thompson has a best friend. And that best friend is Julie Peasgood. And I said, what, me, Uh, playing me? He said, yes. And I said, wow, what's Dame Emma playing? And he said, well, a hard-hitting Northern politician. And I said, (laughs) 
why would she have me as a best friend? He said, darling, I don't know, but they want you. And, and anyway, so he said, he said, shall I send you the scripts? So first of all, I looked down at my, oh, and then he said, oh, by the way, he said, it's a really, I kid you not, he said, it's a really high prestigious, high class drama. And mm-hmm. I said, what? Those very words that I didn't know. Yes. And then I got the script. Danusha, I'm not kidding you. The first scene I was in with Dame Emma, we were in Australia in the jungle in I'm a Celebrity. I say to her, I said to her, you do know that's a kangaroo's anus. And she said, I've eaten worse. In, at the end of the day, <laughs> when we came to do the series, sadly that scene had to be cut because it was overrunning. But I then picked up the third script. And in the third script, we were on Pointless together and we won it. And I later went on Pointless for real. So the thing was, in writing just one set of goals, I got the series. You can't get closer to playing yourself than actually being yourself. That is about as close as it gets. And I'm a celebrity and Pointless in a roundabout way. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is such epic manifestation, isn't it? I mean, yeah, look, at, look at the power of you, just yeah, what you stuck <laughs> towards you, you did. And it's, it's so brilliant to hear. And I, what I love about it is because you've had this insatiable energy and determination. It's obvious all through your life. Oh, yeah, of course, you've had roller coaster times. I mean, come on, my name, you know, that's obvious. But, you know, because you're a human being, by the way. And, and, <laughs> and what's wonderful is that oh my goodness, you are vibrantly, like unapologetically continuing into so much more now, aren't you? I mean, it's like... Oh, yeah. I mean, I told you that story because if anybody's listening and thinking, how can they manifest something they really want? I'm, I'm such an advocate of writing it down and be as specific as you can, but get it written down and keep on looking at it or rewriting it. It really works. It just, it just really, really helps. I think also my chanting helps, but obviously I'm not going to be evangelical and suggest everybody becomes a Buddhist, but that sort of helps me on a personal level. But certainly with, I do think there's, you can't underestimate the motivational uh, value of, of, you know, setting goals. Yeah, Um, exactly. And so you lock it in with your chanting. Other people can lock it in in their ways or maybe begin that. But nevertheless, it is that writing and focus. It is exactly that. I, I, one of the ways that I did, I've got plain tiles in the kitchen and um, I, I write, I, I get a semi-permanent pen and I write the goals on there. And, and uh-huh. so they're right in yeah, front of me. Yeah. So they're right in front of you. Do you mind that, but I presume you don't mind that uh, other people can see them as well because they're not going to make fun of you. They know already Danusha is a woman to be reckoned with and you're going to achieve them. Yeah, exactly. And and I, so I put financial goals on there. I put goals for the, the companies that are leadership development companies going to well, work with and Sure enough, what's what's inspiring about it is though anyone that comes to the house goes, "Did you get that then?" And I go, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." They called me last week. Yeah, yeah, we got a big, <laughs> big, big contract in there, and and so the so the, the and the financial goals. So yes, it does mean that because there is something here, isn't there, about the secrecy of it? Because if we're secret, then it's like, oh, I have a secret goal. It's just mine. And yes, we can focus on it. But there is something incredibly powerful when we release that goal just that bit wider. And so I don't, it's not like I am, you know, I don't take photos and put them on Insta or something, you know, but Mm. actually those who are close to me know what's there and actually must go and look at them and make sure sometimes I forget to update them. And that's, that, that's not good because you get a blockage, but nevertheless, I'm absolutely all over this and, and definitely agree with you that, that this really does make a difference in life. You know what, Julie, we could talk forever. (laughs) We really could talk forever, and I'm I'm conscious, you know. Now, now, come on. What is it? You've a latest thing, haven't you? You've okay, you've two two things just lately that I'm loving. Um, my most favourite role of all is as Granny Peas. Uh, that's what I'm called by my two granddaughters, Saha, who's just turned four, and Angelica, who's not speaking yet, but she'll call me Granny Peas when she can. Uh, she's just saying yeah and no. Um, Jelly is uh, one year old, so. Granny Peas is my 
their favourite role, being grandma. And my other is called Pearls of Wisdom, named after my dear mum, Pearl, the tightrope walker and juggler. And it's something I've had again in a list book for years, 30 years. Saga asked me to get involved at the beginning of lockdown, actually with something that they were um, introducing called the Not Going Out Club, which I thought was a great premise. And I went on and I introed it. Um, you can see all the videos on their site. And then I, I read some, I decided to read some poems and stories, because when we're adults, we don't get stories read to us very often. Um, and then I thought, you know what, I wonder if they'd like my idea of Pearls of Wisdom. And it's about, um, I'm aware we might be running out of time, so I'll go quickly. It, it's it's <laughs> fine. Um, talking about talking to uh, figures of note, important celebrities and things about the greatest advice they've ever been given. Um, because for me, mine was when I was filming Brookside many years ago, and I was having real difficulty in sorting something out with a very tricky situation and a tricky person. And I wasn't getting anywhere. I was trying to be tough, which, you know, trying to be strong and trying all different ways. And the makeup girl in Brookside just she was listening to me one day and she said, Julie, Julie, sugar catches more flies than vinegar. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was brilliant. And I thought, Do you know what? If you treat people kindness, to me, it's probably the most important of all human qualities. And if you treat people with kindness and good manners, you get so much more back than if you try and be aggressive or, you know, whatever. It just doesn't work for me. And it's it's out of character anyway. So I've never forgotten sugar catches more flies than vinegar. And I asked all these other wonderful people. And the funny thing was, Danusha, I got amazing people. I've got Michael Palin, Toya Wilcox, Joanne Clifton, again a Grimsby girl, Dame Esther Ransom, Catherine Parkinson from the IT crowd, Humans, she was last week. Eric Knowles, lovely antiques expert. Michelle Rue, the Michelin-starred chef. Mm. Um, fantastic people. Russell T. Davis himself as well. And I got them because they were all at home. They, had, they were in lockdown too. So everybody suddenly who would normally be too busy had loads of time. And they all gave me the most fabulous pearls of wisdom. And I've sent you a link. I don't know if you got it. I sent it just before we started recording. Um, if you want to put it out to people, they can... Oh, they I can definitely do that. We'll put that in the show notes, Julie, for you. That would be great. Or, or go on to Saga's website. It's easier to click the link, but I'm up there on Saga's website for pearls of wisdom. I think Sharon Marshall is there this week. She's the TV reviewer for this morning, and she's also a writer on soaps, giving the best advice of how to get a job. She's really worth listening to. And Michelle Collins, the actress from EastEnders and Corrie, is uh, coming on at the weekend. So, yeah, they're, they're, I, and I was so thrilled in lockdown. I was determined to make lockdown something, uh, you know, special if I could. So actually getting this out there uh, when it's been in, instead of just in my book of to-do lists has been, uh, has felt really good. Yeah. Well, isn't it, isn't it that really you're determined to make the very best of every stage that you're in and every role? I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. You've, you know, you've pulled, you're pulling off lockdown by contributing and bringing wisdom to others and and all through your career you've you've brought i mean there's so many sides so many roles and oh you're an absolute joy i, I you really are it's so lovely to well, thank you for letting me have it on <laughs> oh it's beautiful and i i know that this you know you're a very very inspirational woman i mean that's obvious isn't it it's 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 a bit silly to even say it but i want well, to say it kettle, because it's important sure. kettle, you're very inspirational <laughs> i'm sure all those people who look at your kitchen tiles go away and make their own goals too <laughs> yeah thank you and thank you so much for being on the podcast i mean it's 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 a true pleasure thank you julie and for me Danusha. thanks a lot take care Julie, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was a delight to talk all things roll with you. I loved exploring Julie's multifaceted career. It reminded me of my Sunday supplement episode with Rebecca Bastian on owning your career path. Check out that episode if you haven't already, listeners. As usual, you can also find all the info on Julie and her work over in the full show notes on schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 
Now, next week on the show, I'll be joined by Anna Bassi, Editor-in-Chief of The Week Junior. We'll be discussing all things news in that episode. I hope you'll join us. That's it till next week, listeners. Same time, same place. Meet me here. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 